Hey everybody, welcome to the Homesteading Academy. We have special guests here for you today and they are Cindy and Gary from Pathways Homestead. And they are going to talk to us today about raising sheep 101. So welcome in. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for um, giving us this opportunity. So I will have to preface this with, I am new to sheep. We have just had a few sheep over the years of our marriage and homesteading lifestyle. But um, my family was into cattle ranching and chickens and rabbits and big, huge gardening was our um, experience with self-sufficiency growing up. And we did have some milk animals a little bit when I was growing up, very young. But um, Gary's family was all out into 4-H and FFA and animals and showing and raising hogs and sheep. So this is my first year to being, I not totally responsible, but being at, more active in the role uh, with the sheep. So um, we're and we're getting close to a year of having sheep, and we started out with bottle lambs. And I'm going to always plug my milk cow. But she was a huge benefit with having raising bottle sh sheep. So I'm not sure how you want us to do this, but I'm just going to kind of give a go over with my first year experience with raising sheep. Um, there are shots. Gary would have to tell you that you're going to need to have for them. If was, your, was your experience bad? No. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> and guys, just t take it away and, you know, whatever you think people, people need to know and, you know, learning experiences, whatever you have to share would be wonderful. Well, I've often heard that the only thing dumber than a sheep is a sheep farmer. <laughs> um, so, and we also, um, in our experience with sheep in the past, Sheep are born looking for a place to die. Yep. And uh, so that's kind of been some of the experience in the past. Right now, this is our first ever hair sheep. Yes. Ever. Yes. That I've ever had, that, that we've ever had. We have raised a few bum lambs. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, I had a few Suffolk ewes when we were right. living in Oklahoma. But um, sheep are really an amazing animal. They're a very efficient ruminant. They are a pretty a happy medium and the best of both worlds of goats and cattle. You get the goat size, which I know some people are like that size. You get the goat, um, the socialization of a goat, but you get the ease of care of cattle. And, and they, they eat grass as well as they eat browse. They love forbs, like clover and stuff. They eat that well. Sheep need roughage. They have to have roughage. All ruminants have to have roughage, and all ruminants are capable of making roughage the majority of their diet. Okay, explain roughage. Okay. Hay and grass and leaves. <laughs> yeah, because we are 101. So okay, we're at, yes. Yeah, we're, yeah. So they... The big thing you do not, if you are supplementing your animals and offering them minerals, you want to avoid copper for sheep, which is total opposite of goats. Um, you do need to be um, very mindful and check very often, routinely, for um, parasites, for anemia in particular. Um, and that is real simple by pulling their eyelids down and looking for the pinkness. If they, their eyelid underneath is pink, is nice and pink or red, you're doing a good job and you're, you're doing all right. With, you're not overloaded with parasites. If it is pale, you want to get active on that very, very quickly. And give them an iron supplement like red cell. Yes. Yeah, give them red cell, which is oral. You would give that, um, force that. You would force that with by tubing. And you just need a small dose of that because it, yeah. it does have a little copper trace in it. Right. So, But you do need to do that to get their, rub, their, their red blood cells back up. And it's just a synthetic. But she, sheep, mm -hmm. unlike goats, they will show parasites in their manure yes. more than a goat will. More like cattle or hogs 
you'll notice it in their manure first. So instead of the little round pebbles, you'll start, they'll start to get looser and have more of diarrhea symptoms. And you'll often see dead worms, yes. dead parasites in their manure. Yeah. A good preventive that um, I'm not, I've not been doing well at is to when you do feed them a supplemental feed, um, like a grain mix or something, that you would put in a, a small handful, depending on how many your herd is. I have a herd of four. I would put in about a, my handful, which is very small, so a quarter to a quarter cup maybe, of diatomaceous earth in that dry feed, and that'll help to, to break up those worms and, and help them pass them. It, you're never going to be par completely parasite-free. All you can do is management. I do have a question so, for you. Yes. So you guys talked about, um, it's funny because you talked about sheep, Gary, about, I don't want to, I don't remember your words, but basically you felt like sheep were trying to die. Yes. There's can, a can, problem about that too. I feel that way about baby turkeys. <laughs> Very true about turkeys too. <laughs> yeah. So can you, can you just explain a little bit of what you mean by that? So our ram, they are in a um, Premier One fencing and another uh, brand of fencing that's similar to Premier One. And they are in that fencing. Our ram has multiple times, even though he's getting a, getting shocked, you know, will wrap himself up into that. And it and so for hours he's standing there till we get home if we're gone or if it's at nighttime. That's his favorite is nighttime. He will just get him try to stick his head through it, get caught up in it, get shocked, and then he just wraps himself and ends up his whole body wrapped up in that fencing. And he just stands. There's nothing else he can do but stand there. Eventually he has to quit fighting. And he has not learned yet, after a dozen times of doing it, to stop. And rams are a whole different genre of sheep. <laughs> Then, then the ewes. The ewes are gentler usually, not always, but usually they're gentler. Um, and with with Mo being a bottle raised ram, because I did bottle raise him, he there are particulars when you are petting a sheep, you want to pet them on the shoulder. You don't want to touch their head. That's going to kick in their instinct to headbutt. So it's just like. You know, a dog playing with a dog with your hand in their mouth and wanting them to, to chew to bite you, you're teaching them to bite. It's the same thing with a sheep. You want to make sure you're petting them on their back or on their shoulder and and not give in to that urge to rub their head. But sheep seem they don't have some of the self preservation instincts right. that like cattle do. Um, I in Wyoming I worked on a couple of rent different ranch operations. Um, hold that for a sec. Come up for it. And wind, like it does in northeastern Wyoming, which I'm sure you're familiar with because you're not far from there. Blocked the wind well and didn't fill up snow, but the rancher had 200 head of sheep go in and it filled up with snow. Also, so they all suffocated um, with the snow. So it's a way, um, you know, a lot of times you know, yes, they got with snow and suffocated. And, uh, but that, you know, you put an old cow in a pasture, and there's something in there that's going to hurt her. If she eats it, she usually won't eat it. Put a bunch of ewes in there, that's the first thing you're going to eat, it seems like. Um, you kind of got. Oh, you froze up on us. I'm waiting for you to come back. Just bear with us, everybody. We'll give them a second. They'll be back. Oh. What happened? Oh, there we are. <laughs> there you go. We got you back. Okay. Okay. So the last thing we heard was that you said you put the you in there and or put the sheep in there and they're going to go right for something they shouldn't eat. 
Yeah, it's it seems that way. I mean, maybe that's an over dramatization, but but um, makes that, the point. That, yeah, and I had we had that happen with some sheep when I was young, and I always remembered that that the you know they died. We took them to the vet. Vet said I think they ate this plant. We walked that whole pasture and found two of those plants. And so I mean, you know, five acres and ten head of sheep, and they should have found plenty of other stuff to eat but they didn't <laughs> um so but the hair sheep are they seem to be even more hardy than wool mm -hmm. sheep um we are currently raising a, a a crossbred kind of i guess you would call it called easy keepers which has some katahdin and has some um dorper in in them they also have some <laughs> romanoff <coughs> And the advantage, there's some advantages to hair sheep. Bear with us, everybody. Rural internet does it every time for us. <laughs> so it happens when we all live in the middle of nowhere. Oh, we lost them. I'm sure they will be back. Here they are. Hi. Rural Hi. internet. Gotta love it. Yes. 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 We're at the lake. <laughs> Where we're supposed to have high speed internet. But it is still pretty iffy at times and it's kind of crazy because we can see the transmitter from where we're at. <laughs> no worries. I totally get it. Um, somebody asked a question about what are the sheep that don't need to be sheared? Is that the hair sheep or? Yeah, yeah hair sheep. Hair sheep. Um, there's many breeds in the hair sheep. Um, you know, there's St. Croix, there's Katahdins, there's Dorpers. And there's probably some others I'm not remembering at the moment. Um, but those, there are several <laughs> breeds in that hair sheep category. And those I think are probably the definitely easier they eat a little more browse a little more tree limbs brush weeds than the wool sheep do they seem to be more parasite resistant than the wool sheep they seem to be less likely to uh, um, they seem to be more disease resistant I guess mm -hmm. and they're definitely bred for commercially or commercially they're bred for producing um, lamb meat and uh, yeah yeah and so that's that you know that's what we have chose to go with this time mm -hmm. and we're really happy with what we're doing we've got a neighbor that we got our bottle lambs from the easy keeper lamb <coughs> and what do they got about 150 ewes yeah yeah about 150 ewes and they run them behind their cattle and are super happy with the job they do and how easy they are to keep the cool thing about the mini wool sheep is twins are the rule pretty much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they do a very good job um, they do a very good job um, cleaning up after the cattle uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, they do a very good job raising the twins. The ewes seem to do a very good job raising the twins. And um, I'm trying to read read comments and talk, and that's not good. I need to quit reading comments. Don't worry about the comments. <laughs> I, I got them covered. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, no problem. So they, they do a good job raising those twins, and they occasionally will raise a set of triplets. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, our hair sheep usually will. And so the profitability goes up on those ewes. It's not a one-for-one one production. It's usually a one-for-two production, which is definitely, you know, that's better than cattle. Um, cattle is always a one-for-one. One. And uh, so, you know, that there's that advantage of them. And that's kind of why we like the wool sheep. That was part of it. The wool or the hair? I mean, the hair sheep. Also, the, the less maintenance. And we felt like they were a little easier to keep alive. Yes. I think so. So um, Mitchell was saying that they had looked at sheep to getting into sheep, and they had mouse sores. Yes. So and he, yeah. he was afraid of a form of herpes for yeah. sheep. 
with all livestock, when you buy livestock, you need to um, look at their health, overall health. And something that I tell people all the time is most ranch vets, most big livestock vets are more than happy to answer a phone call. It's a lot easier to answer your questions over a phone call than it is to spend time going and looking at your animal. And so most of them, if you build a relationship with a local ranch vet, ask him questions, learn the right questions to ask, and that helps a lot with all um, all livestock, it, it, not just sheep. But you need to develop that relationship with a vet where you can call him and say, hey, I've got this and this and this going on, and tell me why, what you think I ought to be doing differently. Um, I tell you. Or what you think I need. Go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. And, and another thing, relationship you need to develop is a, is a relationship with the local feed dealer. Um, I know that big box store feed is pretty popular right now, but you do not get what you get from a local feed dealer. Whether he's milling it or whether he's just selling something that's milled you know, in the state, um, you need to develop that relationship because he can tell you what minerals he's got available for what and what feed he's got available. If you don't know how to read the, the estimated value, feed value on a feed sack, you need to learn to read that. Um, and that's with all livestock. I mean, that's from chickens to beef cattle. Um, you need to be able to do those three things. You need to have a feed dealer that you can talk to and, and feel out for things. You need to have a vet you can talk to and ask questions of, and you need to be able to read the, the feed values on, on feed and on mineral. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And you were talking about the vet. And one of the things that, you know, we struggle with here is, um, as you know, there's a very traditional kind of farming out here. And so there's, we don't have any pig vets. Oh, none. So when the, when the girls farrowed, I had an issue with Fiona and um, just in my nervous panic, right? because it had been so long since she delivered, I ended up calling an emergency vet who I didn't even know because they're different than my regular vet. Now, they didn't call me back until probably late the next morning because they were out with no service doing a horse uh -huh. birth. And, but, you know, they have helped me over the phone because literally I'm just asking for like anatomy guidance. You know what I mean? Like I've done my research we thought there was a stuck piglet. We did an internal. There was no stuck piglet. Um, but I was just looking for what else do I do next? So it, it is a valuable thing to, to have somebody call by phone because I've found even though they don't treat pigs, they have been gracious enough to try and help over the phone. Yes. yes. Yeah. We had that issue with chickens a few years ago. No, there, you know, nobody is has very, you know, they go over a very small percentage of their training like it's it's a, a blurb in a chapter is what one vet told me in their training as vets because chickens survived Chernobyl you know mm -hmm. their chickens are very um, durable at, through what I've learned through going through this with the chickens chickens can eat something radioactive and it not really I mean it'll change the chicken of course they're especially their offspring but they'll survive it so Chickens are your, are your, are your, what was, I was told they were your catfish in your, on your homestead cleanup crew. And, uh, but anyway, they, they're, they're very hardy and. But our, our vet was very good to yes. help us through that, even though they didn't know a lot. Right. And that's the thing about a good ranch vet is a lot of times they'll, they're willing to say, you know, we don't know, but this is my best guess. Yeah. And. And so I'll tell you, if you have chicken issues, University of Nebraska, mm -hmm. they are on top of chicken. I don't know why, but that's who they said was the top in the nation for chicken. So they um, they um, sent my, to, sent two of my birds off for um, intercropping, whatever they call it, a, a, an autopsy, basically to tell us what was going on with those chickens. And it was my mistake. We had gotten new chickens and I did not quarantine them long enough before introducing them to my flock. And they of course were carrying all kinds of nasty stuff. And so 
I ended up we ended up losing over half of our flock and mm. we chose to build, we chose to build resistance um, because we later learned that the wild birds in our area were also carrying some of the issues that we had um, from that wouldn't have been they didn't get them from our flock it was a pre you know from looking at papers done by uh, research studies it was already in our area so we chose to build resistance so um, yeah in, in our we use I'm gonna give them a blurb we use flying three vet service out of Eureka Kansas if you're anywhere within 50 miles of Eureka Kansas I would suggest using flying three a little bit of a struggle they are very 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 busy yes because they are good they're okay. very good they are uh, there it's a ranch vet it's cattle and horse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're in ranch country but they are well willing to help with anything they're just as good with the dog okay. as they are a cow yeah and they're willing to help with anything we like that that because they're busy they're they'd rather answer questions on a phone than come visit you or like with me just I called the secretary when freedom got mastitis I called the secretary and said hey um, you know I don't know what the vet wants to, it's hard for me not to call him by his name because he grew up with our son so it's hard for me not to say his name but anyway to say I don't know what what the vet wants to do about this but um, this is what I've got going on if you want me to bring her in I'll trailer her, I'll bring her in if you want him to come out on a call I'll do that and she's like, well, let's let me talk to Doc. And so um, I got a phone call back from him, and he said, Miss Cindy, this is what I need you to, you know, just I've got this stuff drawn up, ready to do. Um, just come get it. Just come it get it. She said, he said, are you comfortable? He said, you can give shots, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, is Pastor Gary home? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, you can do it, can't you? And I said, yeah. He said, if you can't, I'll come on my way home. And I said, no, I'll give it. Because it was a consecutive for, like, it was she had to have so like a shot and then three or four days later have another shot and it was like in really odd spots like you put it under the skin and it would basically form a dome and then slowly slowly release into her skin as her skin absorbed it and mm -hmm. so he was real good yeah. with that. I knew what to do with the uh, with the um, today that's that's what it's called is today and it's you actually put it in the orifice of the teat and I knew what to do with that. It just comes in a preloaded syringe. It doesn't have a needle on it. You just shove, mm. shove it up in the in the orifice mm. and squeeze it in. And um, but it wasn't available at our at our feed stores. You, there, it's become really hard to come by in the feed stores. Only the vets are able to get it right now. So um, we he had some, thank goodness. And so I, I for a hundred bucks I treated my own uh, my own cow. You know for mm. for mastitis. Mm it early so it wasn't a hard deal we should probably talk about predators yes predator predators. control with sheep mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sheep are fairly um, prone to predate predation um, my uncle used to have a bumper sticker on his truck that said 99 coyotes agree eat American lamb um, <laughs> so you know that the coyotes um, loose dogs eagles for us eagles um, we have bald eagles where we live we don't have goldens occasionally a bald he's big enough and bold enough that he will carry off a small lamb if you're in an area that has goldens goldens definitely carry off lambs um, but with sheep the most vulnerable time for them is lambing and when they're the lambs themselves um, for predation the a lot of times some good um, feisty use and a big bold ram they'll keep a lot of coyotes run off of them but when they start lambing they just can't do that themselves um, right now what we're doing is we've got an unintentional guard dog um, very untraditional too. yeah our old coon dog kind of mellowed out and he's become a really good guard dog so um, that is part of our um, predator control system is him. We also use the Premier One um, and another brand, but Premier One electric netting, and that really does a good job on predator control. We have some friends that have a pretty good flock of um, Katahdins, mm -hmm. 
and to the south of us, and they definitely have coyote problems and some big cat problems, just like we would around here. And they are using mostly the Premier One netting, and it's doing a very good job for them. They do have a guard dog too, but it tends to be in the chicken area and not the lamb area. And so that has helped them. Um, that Premier One fencing helps a lot. It keeps a coyote out most of the time, and that's a good thing. Um, and that's the biggest thing, I think, with sheep is keeping the coyotes and the dogs away from them. Absolutely. And so, so, what, so can, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, so care-wise, care-wise for the sheep, what are some of the things that you do for routine care? You know, like, like obviously we know feed and water and all that, but like, if you don't have pasture, you're giving hay. Yes. All that kind if of you thing. Want, and, you want to have hand, if you have a small enough flock, you want hands on or at least eyes on once a week to look them over. If they're handleable, handle them really well. You don't have to worry, if you've got good rocky ground, you don't have to worry about trimming hooves, but you need to keep an, keep an eye on trimming hooves. If you have sheep with horns, you need to keep an eye on the horns. You know, make sure they're not growing in spots they shouldn't be growing. Yeah, we had one, our ram had a little horn that was growing back into the side of his head. And so a week or two ago, I held him down with a handsaw and sawed it off so that it would quit growing into his Yeah his head yeah, um, that, because, yeah those are kind of care you need to worry about feet you definitely mentioned yeah. that and trimming feet's easy um you need a good pair of, of feet nippers to do yeah. that i just use a sharp knife um but um and, and that's probably not highly recommended but yeah that is what i've done and you don't have to actually to do the inspection you don't have to lift each leg or anything like that you can you, do that you visually can you can do that visually so Hands on if you have gentle enough sheep. If you don't, eyes on. Um, you need to. It, I, I guess all livestock, when you are looking at, at your livestock, especially ruminants, when you're looking at them, you need to walk out and walk up to their pen or out in their pasture. Do they have good water? There has to be good, clean water. Um, sheep, especially. Are they don't hold a lot of water even though they're more of a desert like animal they have to have good access to water three or four times a day I keep it in front of them all the time um, but then um, they need to have enough feed um, <coughs> with a ruminant you need to about over half I always say 75 percent of their feed in in um, needs to be roughage. Their feed intake needs to be roughage. Um, sheep are definitely like that. We feed ours um, a lot of hay when they're not grazing. We Right now they are pretty much living on grass. I use some whole oats to kind of keep them. I feed them that occasionally just to keep them where I can handle with a bucket. Um, but when you walk out in that pen you need to say do they have do they have water? Do they have feed? Do they have um, shade? Um, sheep will, they need some relief from the heat, especially here in Kansas. Um, we finally got below 100 the other day. <laughs> Today it's below 100. Um, so they need some relief from the heat. They need a windbreak when it's cold. They need to just get out of the wind. They don't have to have a barn. They don't have to have a heater, but they need to be able to get out of the wind. Um, so they have a windbreak when they're cold. And then the next thing you need to start looking at is poop. When you walk out of pasture, any any livestock that you've got, you need to look at the poop. Does the poop look like it's supposed to? Is it, you know, is it um, is it loose? Is it dry? Is it, you know, is there parasites? Is there not any poop? Is there an excessive amount of poop? Um, those kind of things help you know health indications. When you talk to a vet, the first one of the first questions he's going to ask you is what does his face, what does the animal's face look like? What's their eyes, their nose look like? And then what does its poop look like? Um, so those are kind of things you need to be looking at as far as walking up and caring for the animal. Um, the, the feed choices vary. Um, if you have access to good quality grass hay 
and a little bit of good quality um, forb hay like alfalfa hay or clover hay, they will live good on that. Sheep live good on, on that, that kind of feed. Right now, you know, like I said, this time of year, ours eat grass and forbs. They just graze all of their intake. And so that is uh, the beauty of ruminants is that they can eat off the ground. They can eat the grass that's growing um, and make good use of that. God designed them to to take grass that we can't eat and turn it into good quality protein. So, um, but in the winter time, there is a protein need in those animals. They definitely still need the roughage. But if you don't have qu uh, access to good quality forb hay like alfalfa that's high protein or like clover that's high protein, and you can supplement with some pellets. Um, there's just there's several different. <coughs> Um, pellets made for or grain mixes made for ruminants that's meant to feed them and I so if I'm feeding a pellet to a sheep I want it to be somewhere around 16 percent protein um, actually last winter we used a 20 percent protein mm -hmm. high fat and it's great but but I need that 16 percent protein for my protein source to my sheep um, now, I'm feeding grass hay that's probably 8% protein. It's not real high protein. So that's what I'm looking for. And um, when I feed them, you're not going to feed a whole lot of protein to those sheep. I mean, we're talking probably 2 pounds per head. Or are we feeding 3 pounds per head? Probably 3 pounds of those cubes per head. A day is gobs plenty. More than enough. I would I would go with one and a half to two one pounds. One and a half pounds, and uh, so you know, and then all the hay they want to eat. You need to let a ruminant fill up on hay. It doesn't have to be high quality. It just has to be palatable, um, so that their stomach's working like it's supposed to. Well, and I say one and a half to two pounds for us because we get quality hay. Um, so our hay will have clovers in it. And so we got to take that into account as well. Um, if if the hay is just the poor ditchweed hay, you know, if they were, if we got the hay that was baled from the ditches, which sometimes is the best hay, better than the hay fields, then um, then we do bump that up to the two and a half. And, and watch your animals if they look lean, bump up that protein and those and those fats um, to a point because you can overdo and then they'll be lean because of the pro too much protein. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a catch mm -hmm. 22 of just knowing, learning to see what you're looking at. And that comes with experience and you're going to have failures. Remember that guys, you're going to have failures. It's going to be sad and it's going to be hard because it's going to involve a lot, another life. And it is perfectly normal for you to be upset about that because it is a, it is a life. It is um, your responsibility. And, you know, I've lost animals through my own ignorance. And it, it's painful, and it sticks with you, and it makes you that much more observant. But that, that animal's life wasn't lost in vain because you learned. And so... It, my, my dad always yeah. calls that the price of education. Yes. It and is it is a you hard... Won't, you won't make that mistake again. You know, It's a I hard mean, lesson... Yeah, I mean, and the animals can't talk to us either. So that's the thing. That's why all the observation that you're talking about is so important. Um, before you get to that question on the screen, I wanted to, uh, Don Ray B had asked earlier, like if somebody is looking in the sheep, what is the first thing that they need to learn or know if sheep are right for them? Well, um, so... I would say that if you're going to raise sheep, you need to have uh, some grass. And the first thing I always get asked about cattle is, how many cattle can I raise per acre? Who knows? You know, and sheep are the same way. Um, we lived in Wyoming where the BLM said it was 100 acres per cow-calf pair. I had a pasture in Oklahoma where I could run a cow per every two acres. So I, I, I can't tell you how much space, but you need some space. Um, your local extension, your county extension, will help you determine how much pasture you really need for sheep um, because they're more familiar with your grass. Um, but um, 
that that's one of the things you need to say if I want sheep I need to have some access to, to some kind of pasture you can supplement with hay um, but you need <coughs> you need to be able to pasture them a little bit at least mm -hmm. and so that's the first thing the second thing is am I willing to deal with predator problems am I willing to make sure that I've got control of the coyotes that I'm, I've either put up a hot wire or I've got a guard dog or I've done a whole lot of trapping and hunting. Um, those things are important. And the next thing is um, you need a mentor. Anytime you are um, starting something new like sheep, you need somebody that can talk to you. Our neighbor that raises the 150, um, 150 easy keepers, she's mentored Cindy very heavily through this and just, you know, phone call away and and has helped us and that's where we got them from and guys I, you know Cindy and I have been in the livestock game and the homesteading game for 20 who knows as married yeah and, and all <laughs> together our we've been yeah. doing it 20 some odd years but we still get everything we do mm -hmm. and, and you know YouTube is nice and it, it, there's some things to be learned here these classes like this are great um, going to events like the home the Ozark homesteading expo next week those are great events, and there's things to learn there. There's things to learn on this um, homesteading academy, things to learn there. But you still need a mentor. You still need hands-on, flesh and blood, look me in the face and look at what I'm doing and say you're making stupid choices. You need that. And um, so that's one of, I guess, our biggest suggestions is find a mentor. If you think sheep are right for you, find a mentor. Another thing I would suggest, if you think sheep are right for you, go visit somebody that's got sheep. Yeah. Um, and you know, see what they're doing, and see if they like them. If you like them, um, sheep are definitely—they've um, got their own character. They've got their own attitude. Some people can't handle sheep. Um, it sheep drives some people nuts. Um, I love sheep. I, I like ruminants. I, I'm a ruminant guy. I say that, but I'm a pig farmer too. But um, we. Cindy and I are livestock people, so we like sheep, you know. Um, that's that's good for us. But that would be, I guess, my biggest suggestions is you need to be have some grass. You need need to, um, or pasture, it doesn't have to be grass. They will eat brush. Um, you need to have, be able to find a mentor, even if it's somebody you have to talk to on the phone, you need a mentor. You, and you need to go visit somebody that has sheep. If, if possible, yep. volunteer to help them and learn from them if possible. That could possibly be your mentor. I have you know, to say um, the best advice ever because we were we were blessed when it came to the pigs to have somebody near us who graciously, I didn't even know her. She graciously offered for us to hang out up there with the pigs and the breed. We did that. We ended up getting ours and I have a mentor who's in Texas who was literally messaging with me while my pigs were delivering. <laughs> and even if yeah. just for the emotional support, because, you know, you had the intellect, but you needed somebody to just reassure you that everything was going to be okay. But it, it just was yeah. so, so helpful. Yes. Yeah. That moral support is, is a huge, huge thing. And a flush ration for when you're getting ready to breed? Uh, we we don't. Do we give them a special ration whenever we're getting them ready to breed? Feed I know ration. with pigs, they, they talk about yep. doing a flush ration a, like a month or so before. I didn't do that with mine either. I, that's that's never anything that I have done in... In my years of keeping livestock, I've, I've never really done much of that. Now, saying that, I just try to keep the health good. Um, and, and something I guess I didn't mention um, with the ruminant, if, if they're not at some point in the day, if they're not sitting under the shade somewhere or sitting out of the wind somewhere and chewing their cud, um, that's an indicator that they're not getting the roughage they need. If they're up grazing all the time and they never go set and chew their cud there's something going on there but I just try to keep my health good on my animals all the time 
and I seem to do okay so far with breeding and everything. I'm gonna tell you that we haven't these hair sheep. We have not lambed them out yet, but so broke, broke cowgirl. <laughs> Are you really a homesteader or a farmer if you have everything ready when they get there? That's been our joke all along. That's been our joke all along because we have um, – it's a great concept. It's a great idea, and I yeah. think it is wonderful, and it is good practice. I, I've it's, heard it's a great concept to have everything ready when you get them. I don't know, but <laughs> – We just unfortunately have rarely done that. <laughs> So I, I was taught that the reason that pickups have headlights is so you can build a pen with the headlights of the pickup while the animal's in the back. <laughs> I've not done it with livestock. I've done it with chickens. We brought chickens home and said, oops, because, <laughs> you know, the deal came up. You got to you got to take advantage of the deal. But that's right. And we've always had it. It's. We we always used we had a, a, a we always had an empty coop that used to be um, our meat bird coop and our turkeys are in it now, and it was funny because we had the pig area ready and we were all proud of ourselves, but then when we got them, we were afraid that they would get through parts of the panel even though it was hog panel, because they were so little and we were like you're going in the coop because <laughs> it's enclosed. <laughs> We use the we use the big brooder for that, the big chicken brooder for all the small animals because you know the pens usually are too small. But yeah, we we um, have rarely had been prepared, and but we unfortunately we have become the habit of of look bargain hunters. And so like when the opportunity like I had we had talked about sheep, we knew we wanted to go in that direction. We just had not gone there, and then our neighbor calls and said, hey, I've got some bum lambs. I don't have the time to, to take care of them. And in our area, the auction is once a month, and during um, this time of illness, they weren't having a regular sale, regular, a sale regularly, and so it was difficult to know um, when they were having a sale and when they weren't. And she just she said, I, I, don't, I don't want to... Um, have to dispatch them. I'd like them to go somewhere, so I'll make you a deal. <coughs> so we bought our sheep that we have now, our current herd, with firewood. Yes, we paid for them with firewood. <laughs> with yeah, Gary Broke Cowgirl. Broke Cowgirl said she's like, yeah, things come up. Um, but she was saying with large livestock, she sees so many that don't have a trailer to haul in and don't have perimeter fencing. And, and I agree, you have to be you have to be ready for the deal, but you also want to try to be ready for animals if possible. And sometimes that's community. Yeah. So you know, when we got uh, first got our cattle, we didn't have a trailer, so um, we could bar but we had one that we knew when it, we could go and hook up a two and haul. Well, Freedoms, when we got sprayed, Gary's pickup was down. And so we didn't have anything to haul a trailer, pull a trailer with. And um, so we had a neighbor we called and said, hey, my, Cindy's milk cow is sick. And he, and it happens to be um, one of our dear, dear mentor yeah. parent figures. And he said, I, I'll be right there because he knows, he knows my cow is, you know, if you did the the pet or um, I forgot what it was called. Anyway, there's a challenge out right now talking about is, is your animal a pet or um, a purpose or a pet or product? Yeah, purpose or pet. Thank you. And I, I've she's been thinking, both. yeah, she's both. Um, her purpose is multiple fold, but she is also like my pet. You know, most laid, oh, most ladies when their kids grow up and leave home, they get a little dog. I got a 75 750 pound milk cow i mean that's just the type of, you know i guess you can take the girl off the ranch but you can't take the ranch from the girl so um i have always loved cattle loved working cattle with my dad even when it was stressful <laughs> because i should i love my dad but the prep work is not there for <laughs> you know proper working pens what are those but um <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. I've got a summer cold. <coughs> so, yes, good pens, infrastructure 
is great. And if you can do that, please do. Yes. Please do that. We would encourage you to have something ready, <laughs> especially for some way of calling them. I encourage you to have something ready. Um, it, it, it is important that you have. And we joke about that. But we have always lived a lifestyle where there are posts and there are panels and there are those things there on our place. And, and you know, we've got something to haul animals in. That's just kind of our lifestyle. So, yeah, that specific area wasn't ready, but I could put it together in an hour or two. You know? um, right. So that, that's kind of always been who we are. And so it's kind of a joke to not be ready in, in, in many ways compared to, where some people are starting, we're always ready. There's always powdered colostrum in our freezer. Um, and multi um, now multi-species. So colostrum for, for sheep and goat. A little, you can pick it. It's expensive, but pick it up. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't um, take much. It doesn't take much. Um, if, if that's something you're planning on doing, you, you, can, you can budget out and prepare slowly. And um, if you're going to fly like by the seat of your pants like us, you need to be prepared to fly by the seat of your pants. Have the resources available to build the pen. Have the resources available to bottle feed the animal if, if necessary. Have a, um, yes, good, Leanne's got a perfect point. Goat colostrum is universal, can be used on all ruminants. Um, I, the, the truth is, is um, <laughs> if you're using real colostrum, not powdered, yeah, is that cattle colostrum is universal too. But your colostrum, if you're using fresh colostrum and not the powdered, you need to know that after three months that starts to deteriorate and um, the value goes down. Even in the freezer. Even in the freezer. Um, your powdered colostrum will have up to a year. So you, if you've got it in there a year, you need to replace it just because those values will go down. So question. Um, it's still so, yeah. So I bought a multi-species bag of colostrum for my pigs, and we did not use it because thankfully everything went okay. So it's sealed. Should I throw it in the freezer so it lasts longer? I would, yes. And it will last a year? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Lisa, it may last longer than that. Um, that that's just kind of a rule of thumb. You know, um, we don't get rid of it. We feed it. Well, we'd feed it, but I might not depend on it to be right. a colostrum. We might so Yeah, we might. Um, if we feed it to a, a bottle baby, it would be, we would use um, new, fresh. We would use fresh and then add a little bit of that in there as extra. You know, do the recommended dose, normal, and, and, you, then, and, back and then back it up with the other. Just so, because you're not going to, I mean, you might give them the scours if you overload them a little bit. But there, you're. I think you're going to be okay. If okay. if I've had it in there a year and a half, I'm gonna I'm going to put it in my chicken feed, or an or use it on a more, more mature animal that doesn't necessarily need colostrum, but it'll get a bit of boost to add in with its normal bottle ration. Um, a lot of things go to the chickens. You can put it in your hog feed and just give your your hogs a, a boost. Like mm -hmm. if you're if next time you're hog pharaohs and you've got that old colostrum and you've prepared and you got new colostrum, put that in your sow's feed. That'll give her a boost. That'll help her immunity. That'll help her um, re replenish from her from her ordeal. You know, nice. Plus, milk is kind of like putting sugar on stuff. It'll help them eat better. Yep. Nice. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So I just but, I, oh, go ahead. Leanne said that, that colostrum is very expensive, and it is. We, um, community is our, yeah. I mean, community is important to us, and so we'll keep some powdered colostrum or some frozen fresh colostrum, and it's quite common for me to get a call in the evening saying, hey, I've got a cow that calved, and I can't get it to let it suck, and do you have some colostrum? And so I'll say, yeah, come get it, and they'll use it. And maybe a month later, I'll get some colostrum returned to me, mm -hmm. or I might not get it returned to me, but in the middle of the night, if I need it, I'm going to call that person and say, hey, did you get some more after that? And I'll say, yeah. And so we kind of pass that around. That way, there's within a few miles of the house, there's some colostrum somewhere. That's good. That's good. 
So I just put in the chat if anybody had any questions for you, because we've got about 10 minutes left, and I just wanted to be mindful of your time as well as everyone else's. Um, if anybody has any questions, please type them in the chat. Um, but this has been really helpful. I really appreciate you guys being here today. So I, another thing that I think we should talk about mm -hmm. when we're talking about sheep is eating them. <laughs> um, so I, I am I'm not a pet person and I grew up that even our dogs were not just pets they were hunting dogs or they were cow dogs or, or they have a purpose even our cats have a purpose and so if you're raising sheep they need a purpose there is wool sheep that you can raise for fiber production but for the most part especially hair sheep are raised for meat and um, another thing I think I would do if you are considering raising sheep I'd go eat a lamb chop before I bought sheep. Um. <laughs> I would take. I would buy some lamb from a from a locally sourced if you can, or you know if it if all you have available is commercial. And I would get on some wonderful cooking channels and learn to prepare the lamb because lamb is prepared a different way, and there are some steps you need to take for that to be more palatable. You know. Um, yeah, for one thing. Um, one thing you'll learn about lamb over beef is you don't want to eat lamb cold. Right. Um, lamb's always better warm. Yeah. Um, and there are some spice seasonings that sure bring out the flavor of a of lamb. Rosemary is yes. one that we have found. Rosemary and salt does a lamb chop a lot of good. And garlic. <laughs> and garlic and onion and rosemary do a leg of lamb a lot of good. And um, those are things that we have found. But we learned in Wyoming, I would work for different sheep farmers. Actually, I worked as a butcher, and I'd go dispatch for different sheep farmers. And then we would take it to the place that I butchered. And one of the things I learned from some of them was just to take a leg of lamb and put it in a crock pot and cover it in lifted onion soup mix and a little rosemary and let it cook. And it was really good. But you can make your own Lipton soup mix that is, it doesn't have all the junk in it. <laughs> just so you know. And yeah. So yeah, there's lots of good ways to prepare it. Was there any questions? Yeah. I didn't see any questions. No, I don't see I've any questions. State. But yeah, you okay. really raised some great points because homegrown meat is so different than anything. Absolutely. And, I mean, even it if is. you look at chicken, right? But you know, like you said, lamb, that's really important because I didn't think of that. You know, there's people who maybe never had lamb, you know, especially right. homegrown. Right. Um, so I think that's a really good point. I did want to ask one question myself. I heard somebody say the other day that, um, their sheep got stuck on its back in the middle of the night and passed away because it was unable to burp was what the terminology that they used. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that real quick. Um, it was a whole room and it's it's, can get a twisted gut. That that is that's something that can happen to livestock. It can happen to a hog too. I've never heard of them getting stuck on their back, but I know that um, I, I've seen horses roll over and get a twisted gut. And so um, if if a if a sheep gets a twisted um, gut in there somewhere, and they've got four stomachs, they're rooming it. One of those can get twisted, and if if gas is not cannot move and if fecal matter cannot move that that will kill one and so the first thing um usually you'll notice that a sheep's just not acting like it feels good it just mm -hmm. stuck okay. its head down it's not coming to feed um when that happens you need to get on the ball and figure out what's going on and that's usually the first sign um, I've never, usually twisted gut doesn't kill something overnight. It's usually a day or two into the game. So, um, and, I, and bloat is, an, and that may be what they're talking right. about. It might be bloat. Mm -hmm. Bloat is something you need to watch for too. Um, kind of the same thing. Won't feel good, but it also <laughs> look really swollen up. And uh, get on the phone with your vet and say, hey, I've got a sheep. And I think it's bloating. This is what it's doing. And what do I need to do? Um, some vets will suggest a shot. Some vets will actually su suggest a surgery. Um, I have used a pop bottle and soapy water 
which just makes them poop and pass gas. Right. But. Mm -hmm. So my guess is they they probably got so bloated that when they got on their back, they couldn't get back up. Does that gotcha. make sense? Mm -hmm. That they could, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Is, yeah. You know, yeah. That's that's probably and they will like um, wrote cowgirl saying they all they'll they just get where they just can't and that and sometimes those things are easy to miss um, mm -hmm. especially if you don't know what you're looking for um, oh miss what kind of sheep we raise we raise easy keepers it's a new uh, crossbreed that is I don't believe it's registered it's just kind of a um, a breed that has been crossed up for production meat production and for the ease of care so yeah and that you know I don't know I'm going to use some terminology that people like a Santa Gertrudis cattle it is actually a crossbred that has been crossbred to the point that now it produces after its own kind and that's kind of what an easy keeper is okay mm -hmm. okay well thank you so much um, any Quick, any last questions? We got a couple minutes left. I just want to make sure of everything. I'm going to just put easy keepers, meat sheep, in the comments for everybody. Eating too much or something new in that. Yeah, that's yep. correct. Yeah. I. Yeah. And bro, yeah. girl, I've used soapy water, and it it does kind of the same thing as an acid. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot about sheep today. This is really cool. <laughs> But they are very much um, sheep are really neat animals. Yeah. They they are fun. They they they've got their own personalities. Yeah. They like to be around people. Yeah, like goats. They're, that was where I was going. They're very personable. They like to be friendly. Social. Social. Yeah, social. Very social. Very well, social. Awesome. So when well, they get, they're going to be on your porch just like a goat. <laughs> They're going to chase the kids around the yard. They're going to chase the ducks. They love to chase the ducks. That's mm -hmm. like their favorite thing in the world. They're going to be in the garden. They're going to go eat all your kale. And they love kale. So kale is a good treat for them so long as you don't overdo. That's funny. Well, guys, I really appreciate you coming in today and helping us all learn more about sheep. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having us. Well, I hope you feel better, and I hope you enjoy your time at the lake. Thanks. We're going to go back home here in a little bit. Oh, cool. That's a great resource. Good, yeah, good, Sheepishly good. Me is really awesome. Yeah, what's the lady with the big operation? Sandy, Sandy, Sandy Brock. Yeah, Sandy Brock is another one. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, I haven't right, watched well, Sheepishly Me. I'm going to have to check. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. And everybody in the chat, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. And we'll be coming out with more series, but just a great way to learn from folks' experience. And you can hear the difference between Cindy being a year into it and Gary's been at it for a while, but it's just really perfect to have everybody's different perspectives. So thank you all so much. Okay. Cool. Did, cool, you, have, cool. did you have something? Thank you. No, we were reading um, Broke Cowgirls. She said, Sheepish, sheepishly me is Sandy Brock. <laughs> yeah. Great minds like. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. We appreciate you so much. Oh, likewise. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Thank See you. you. Later. See you later. Bye-bye.